I'm really proud of its heritage. And so we're sort of launching these. It's hilarious. We met up with Jackie as she was working on her yeah. shed out back. And, uh... <laughs> she was hanging a bunch of pictures. <laughs> This podcast of The Bourbon Pursuit is sponsored by the folks at thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for people who always make sure they have whiskey in their life, not because it gives them style, but because it gives them life, thewhiskeywash.com. And we're back with another episode of The Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. My name is Kenny, and I've got Ryan here today as well, and we are at a little restaurant here in Nulu called Rye. Uh, Tell us about it, Ryan. Yeah, Rye is a great spot, you know, here in... Like you said, New Lou, it's on Market Street, uh, downtown Louisville, which is a really up-and-coming area. There's tons of great restaurants and bars here. It rises up. It's got a great uh, cocktail list, you know, a lot of bourbon-focused drinks. And their their food menu is great because it's always something different. Their chefs are really progressive. They, you know, really have some good food that I think if you're, you're doing the bourbon trail, you know, you're coming back downtown, you need a place to eat that you want to get a great cocktail and a great meal. I think Rye would be a really cool spot. It's got a really cool ambiance and, and feel to it. It definitely is. And we were actually talking to our guest beforehand and it definitely has that kind of like speakeasy, dimly lit kind of feel when you come in and it's uh, pretty awesome when it when it looks like that. So let's go ahead and, you know, because we are talking about cocktails and we have uh, somebody who is uh, considered the master in, in the bartending world or a rock star, if you will. So uh, to date, we have Jackie Zykan uh, or Zeken, Zykan, 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 Zykan. It's actually a pretty cool word to kind of talk about. <laughs> Get a few bourbons in you. We'll just we'll throw that one down. It's more. But Jackie is the master bourbon specialist for Old Forester. So Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great. So let's kind of kick it off and we ask all of our guests. So kind of give us your coming to tale or coming to age story of how you got into bourbon or how bourbon kind of influenced you, your kind of affliction with it. Sure. So I'm originally from St. Louis. I've only been in Louisville for about five years now. Um, but I've always been a whiskey drinker. It just, I hate to say this, but it was always sort of a self-indulgent comedy to me that this little blonde was always sipping a whiskey at the bar when that was completely unexpected back home. So when I moved to Louisville, it was like Candyland. It was just amazing. I mean, so many different brands, so many different companies based here and all the history, they're all so rooted together. Um, so I've been bartending since the day I legally could. Um, it was a Sunday. I turned 21 and it was my Sunday bar shift. It was football Sunday. It was horrible. And I was probably <laughs> awful. And messed thrown everything up. Right. One. Thrown to the wolves, but glad to do so. Um, and just remained in that position all through college and kept it up, moved here, started bar managing. And then the restaurant group I was with, just expanded and so I grew with them and took a beverage director position with them overseeing all of their different concepts and like I said you know all the brands are based here and so of course when someone needs a shaker for hire you get to know these people on a you know independent contractor basis sort of and um old forester was just always the most authentic and my favorite of all of them I don't think I would have said yes to jumping out from behind the bar for any other brand Mm -hmm. than this one to be totally honest so why is that what, what is um, it about this brand? That- this brand is, I mean, it's Louisville's own. You know, it's the only bourbon that's actually made, aged, bottled, everything here start to finish. And it was always one of the best kept bartender secret bourbons. Most bang for your buck, if you will. Um, it's definitely worth. Yeah, because I'm sure most people oh, yeah. know wood for reserve. But mm-hmm, absolutely. Most people don't know it's Old Forester. You know, it's where it comes from. So. Well, okay. <laughs> well, here we so, go. Oh, here we go, here we go with the, the bun- conversation. Start the myth debunking. So there are two actually very, very different bourbons from a production standpoint. So I think there's a lot of weird myths out there about how Woodford is just overpriced Old Forester or, you know, Old Forester is just cheap Woodford, et cetera, et cetera. There's actually a different wood used for the barrels and different aging and there's different production. Old Forester is strictly column still. Woodford is actually a, a mingling of pot still and column still. So it's, it's not every drop of juice meant to be Old Forester always ends up Old Forester. Every drop meant to be Woodford ends up Woodford, and there's no sort of we're running low, let's pull from the stock this year kind of situation. Right. They're well, very distinct brands. Yeah. Now, we can, now you know. Put that one to rest, There right? you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we had some like sound effects we could put in, like, oh, bust it, right? <laughs> <laughs> now I feel like an idiot. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's common, but, I mean, they're very, very different. They're very different strategically. I mean, Old Forester... 
it's, it's very like city mouse, country mouse in a way. El Forcer has always been this urban brand and Woodford is, you know, the romance of the horses and the field and the old distillery and everything else. Mm-hmm. So El Forcer is an industrialist, urban, the working, man. Ama- the working man's brand. <laughs> Sorry, sure. <laughs> if you want to go that route, sure. So let's talk about uh, what it is you actually do as a, as a master bourbon specialist. So if, because hmm. I... We all kind of have these get thrown in these roles where you like get to make up like, hey, this is what I get to do right. today. So like, give us a kind of a, right. a, a day in the life of Jackie. Every day is different. Today I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's media interviews such as this. Uh, there's a lot of travel involved for sure. I act as a spokesperson for the brand on a global scale, so I'm all over the place. Um, there's a lot of staff trainings, whiskey trainings, cocktail trainings, all the video content stuff that you see on our Facebook page, Instagram, all of that is my face, Mm -hmm. whether you want it to be or not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, the recipe construction for the website, all of that, that whole strategy comes from my hands. Um, this year I was lucky enough to start working with Chris on the birthday bourbon Mm -hmm. process. So that'll be really cool to get more in depth into the production side of things as opposed to just the marketing side of things. Right. Because I have a science background and so that's what's tickled me from the get go. It's just sort of everything coming together. I guess what, what makes you excited about that, right? Because I have read that you have that kind of science background. Mm -hmm. You've got a huge background in bartending and mixology. Mm -hmm. And so how does that all like play a culmination to, to where you are now. I know it sounds really strange. Um, but I originally set out to study biology and chemistry to go to medical school and changed my mind halfway through, which I hard, think hard, most hard people, right, turn. right, <laughs> hard, right, hard, right. Um, I graduated in 2008 and it was not the year to try to find a job. I mm-hmm. think the only job offer I had was to be a seed counter for a company I shall not name. And I'm glad I said no. Cause now, you know, here we are talking about it. Right. Um, but the interest always laid in alcohol and spirits and bitters as having medicinal origins. And that always tickled my fancy a little bit. And to be perfectly honest, I am not, I don't know, my PR manager is probably going to freak out about me <laughs> saying this, but I... She is looking over your shoulder. I know. She, <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut. Um, I definitely am a little bit more raw about things from time to time, I think. It's mm-hmm. it's refreshing from the conservative Brown Foreman standpoint that it's a little bit more, I don't want to say edgy because I don't consider myself edgy. But yeah, at the same time, though, um, where am I going with this? we got to cut through the BS sometimes, right? Exactly. There you go. So I come from a position from one side of the bar that I really enjoyed and really loved doing cocktails and really loved the whole history of all of the spirits. Um, and I love the physical nature of the job. You're constantly running around, squatting, turning, shaking. You know, it was just nonstop. Um, it just, it was fun. Bartending is fun. And you get to meet a lot of people. Some you like, some you don't. You know, like, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that, the whole no BS side of it, you also meet a lot of sales reps and suppliers and all of these people who are peddling all these different products and they're all in a suit and they're all like memorizing statements that when I got to the level of doing bar management and beverage directing and I was actually dealing with them on a regular basis, I couldn't stand it. And I don't know. I don't know if I was ever perceived as being hard to work with or not, <laughs> but just I don't appreciate the line, you know, just tell me what it is and then we'll right. make a decision based on that. So can we not just be honest and authentic about things like Right. What's so hard about that? So, like I said, that's part of the reason why Old Forester, there's nothing to hide. I mean, it's just really good whiskey. There's Mm -hmm. no, like, weird made-up marketing story and fake great-grandfathers, like... It is what it is. You right. don't have to church it up to be anything else. And that's that's we've we've had plenty of interviews where we've debunked the history of some of the brands right. and how they're just figments of imagination. So I mean, I guess uh, you know how well are you versed in the old Forster history? Because I, I think we'd love to dive into that a little bit. Okay, so let's let's talk about <laughs> a little bit. So you know, Old Forster is produced by Brown Foreman, and it's one of their flagship brands. And from my reading, what I can gather, it's the longest running bourbons on the market today, spanning almost 145 years. And it was all started by a, a guy named George Garvin Brown. Could you, what do you know about George Brown and, and what, how, because around here, the, the, name, has a lot of money. the name Brown has a very, <laughs> yeah. very big stigma and like has a lot of prominence here in Louisville. So I guess kind of talked about, you know, what, what he did, uh, kind of you know, what he did behind Old Forester. For sure. So... The Brown family, um, 
and we can knock off one of the old Forrester big questions right off the bat as to why it's spelled with just E or without an E, it's spelled with just a Y instead of the E Y, like most bourbons are. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about Scottish heritage here. So, as a general rule of thumb, any whiskey that comes from the country that doesn't have an E in it doesn't have an E in the whiskey. Right. It's easy to remember that way. So, checkbox, got that done. one out of the way. All right. <laughs> Chee Chee. All right. So, George Garvin Brown sort of serves as this like quintessential example of the industrialist, like the feel of America. I mean, people came here on a boat because they were told there was somewhere great to go, but they didn't know where they were going. And it was months and you hope you make the trip and like, then you have to survive once you get there. It's a work ethic and it's dedication. And George Garvin Brown was a man who was really, really good at seeing opportunity, not taking advantage of it, but seizing it in the right way. So at Old Forcer, we sort of hang our hat on this whole first bottle of bourbon situation, Mm -hmm. right? George Garvin Brown started out as a pharmaceutical sales rep. And in this time, we're talking about whiskey being sold by the barrel exclusively. You can't see in a barrel. You can throw anything in there and call it whiskey and spread it out and make more profit on it. Why wouldn't you just put it in a bottle? Someone had to say that eventually, and it was right. so great. Um, but it's already sealed. You already know. It, it's I wouldn't so actually. I, I don't even know what to do if I bought a barrel of bourbon nowadays. That'd be- <laughs> <laughs> and you can, and we'll sell you one. But, So back then you go, you know, get your little jug and you go to the pharmacy or the apothecary and you fill it up with quote unquote whiskey and hope that it's good. But I mean, that could be tobacco juice. It could be anything in Mm -hmm. there just to make it look right. There's a huge opportunity there of, okay, why didn't you just seal it? Why didn't you just seal it? So, you know, it's always going to be the same and you know, it's always going to be good. So George Garvin Brown seizes this opportunity, um, and uses sort of the, the first celebrity spokesperson, if you will, for a bourbon brand, uh, Dr. Forrester. That's where we get the name Old Forrester. Mm-hmm. And I know that you had on your list somewhere something about the extra R. We have to talk about we the gotta extra R. we got to talk about the like, R. Why was that, the R dropped or was it ever R. there? It was there. It was there. So Dr. Forrester was a Civil War surgeon, very, very well known. We're talking about an era of whiskey for medicinal purposes. Mm-hmm. So, of course, this prestigious physician... Let's tag his name onto it. If he stands behind it, of course it's got to be a great product, correct? When he was no longer a practicing physician, it was deemed by George Garvin Brown, this is no longer appropriate to use his name. He's no longer a physician. Mm -hmm. Drop one R. It's technically not his name anymore. Right. So there you go. There were two R's for the doctor. Retires. Now there's one R. Still old Forster. No royalties have to be spent. Yeah, it's like. Well, it's I like, didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like Doctor Colgate. Now we gotta start calling him like Doctor Cogate, right? You just yeah. drop the L. <laughs> <laughs> Spell it with a K. Yeah. Same, right? <laughs> no, no, no. So that's where we are. I mean, that's 1870. We're talking wagons. I mean, there's still like Germany's not even a country at this point. Like, there's not even a catalog in existence at this point. We're talking a long time mm-hmm. ago, as far as American history goes, right. a long time ago, right? So, yeah, and we it's never gone away. Mm-hmm. It's never been or it hasn't been the most popular bourbon for 145 years, but that just shows the dedication the family had because the Browns, it's been George Garden Brown of Brown Foreman. Mm-hmm. It's been the whole family. The same, the same family this entire time. And right. so this is what they started on. This was the mark of quality that the entire brand started on. This was the original product. This wasn't an acquisition. This is our great-great-grandfather legitimately delighted in this brand, and we're going to keep it going and drink it at Thanksgiving every year in his honor. So right. And, and I guess to kind of go with that, you know, when he first started... Um, he was acquiring barrels and kind of like doing that because you know, he wasn't he was oh, yeah. a pharmacist, right? Like, he wasn't a distiller, or exactly. Whatever. So I guess kind of how did how did Old Forest get to the the part where they've got a distillery and a showcase and like all right. that kind of stuff, right? So we pulled from three different distilleries in the beginning: Atherton, Melwood, and Mattingly. And then in 1902, we actually ended up purchasing the Mattingly Distillery. But it's not like I know there's a lot of judgment nowadays about you don't distill your own; you just go and pick barrels from some warehouse in Indiana or what have you. This wasn't like that. This was a close business relationship that we had with Mattingly Distillery the entire time, and the demand was high enough where we needed to take ownership of the production there. So it's different then. It's completely different. So we start in 1870. We're 90 proof. We're mingling three different distilleries' juice to make a consistent flavor profile of what it should be. Whiskey should be 90 proof. It should taste this way. It should be balanced in these different aspects. And then the whole bottled and bond controversy comes in. I know you guys are fortunate enough to be drinking 1897 yes, bottled right. and we bond are, right now during right this now. interview Tasty. the bottled and bond act was i mean 
there's a lot of 100 proof four year old whiskey on the market that's not quality. It doesn't mean quality. It just means it's 100 proof four years old, one distillery, one distillery. You guys know the whole mm-hmm. bottle to bond situation. So we didn't want to bond our whiskey because we're 90 proof. Well, you can't be the one guy that doesn't bond your whiskey when everyone's saying, well, there's rectified whiskey and then there's distilled whiskey and yours is going to be quality and yours isn't. So, of course, we go along with it. Hence why we celebrate that great decision by introducing the Whiskey Row series that you guys are sipping on right now. Right, right. Well, that's awesome. So I guess let's, let's uh, I guess, fast forward, rewind, whatever it is, about 1920 during Prohibition, mm-hmm. right? Because Prohibition was a, was a dark time for, for a lot of these. A, a lot of companies went out of business because barrels were getting seized. They were getting destroyed. Um, many companies just went under because uh, at that time you couldn't sell your stock. You couldn't give it away at that point. So I guess a good question for you is how did Old Forester survive that and, and, and what kind of kept that going past prohibition? So there were a limited number of medicinal whiskey permits thrown out there during prohibition. There were six of them. There were 10, but I want to say that only six were used and we were number six. We actually had the ability to within the reasons and within all of their rules produce as needed during prohibition. Um, so we never stopped being available. There was, there were certain windows when you could distill and certain volumes to which you could distill, but we, we just never went away. I mean, which speaks a lot. There's some brands that were there before and some that, you know, came back right afterwards once mm-hmm. everybody could drink again. Not drink again, I guess, but sell it again because everyone drank <laughs> the whole. So let's be honest yeah. here. No one stopped <laughs> drinking. But yeah, we just we were there the entire time. So we're talking about medicinal whiskey. We're talking about bonded whiskey. We're talking about hundred proof straight through until 1933. So Old Forester definitely takes us as a point of pride. You know, we've never gone away. We've always been on the market in some mm-hmm. way, shape, or form. Right. And then, so there was a, something that you hinted at earlier about how the difference between Old Forester and Woodford and how they're using different kind of woods and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you're you're very unique in the fact that Brown Foreman actually owns its own cooperage. It does own its right? own cooperage. Uh, like it's one of, if not the only brand. I that, think it or, is the only. Yeah, exactly. So I guess kind of talk about uh, what that means and, and part of the process. and. Absolutely. So Brown Foreman whiskey is using Brown Foreman barrels. So Jack Daniels, Woodford, early times, Old Forcer, we all have our own wood. Like I hinted at earlier, you can't see inside a barrel. It's, you know... When you're buying barrels on the open market, you're trusting that it's being toasted or charred to a certain specification. But really, are you peeking in? Like, are you taking a flashlight to the bunghole? Like, no, mm-hmm. no one does that. So it's a huge part of the flavor of bourbon. I mean, bourbon is oak. Let's be totally honest with you. It's a whiskey category that uses fresh new oak. It's charred. Every ounce of color in there is coming from the barrel. So much of the flavor is coming from the barrel that we really think it's In the quality sense, so important to control that process from start to finish. So, yes, Old Forester has its own specific barrels. Woodford has its own. Jack Daniels has its own. Early Times uses, Early Times whiskey uses used barrels. Early Times bourbon uses new barrels, but Mm -hmm. that's an export item. So, yeah, it's important. Yeah, and and I guess with that, let's talk about the, the, I guess you could say the four pillars of of Old Forester, maybe five, right? I guess because we don't have the birthday bourbon here, uh, what we're looking at. But, Rye has it. It's oh, downstairs. Yeah, okay. We let's, can always Yeah, let's go sneak down this game. Um, <laughs> but I guess kind of talk about the different variants uh, of each of the brands uh, and kind of talk a little bit about each of them and kind of what makes it more unique or special compared to the, sure. the next. So, and we have them all on the table here, so this will be easy to go through. Starting from Old Forester 86 Proof. 86 Proof, this is introduced in the late 50s, early 60s when cocktails are starting to become popular and when i say cocktails i mean highballs i mean light blended whiskeys vodkas gins things of that starting to creep into the scene this is our response where was old forester up until then we were bonded we we were bonded in 1897 and we remained bonded up until we'll talk about signature next but so at this point late 50s we've got 86 and a branch of bonded Mm -hmm. right all right so this is about four years old it's yeah. About four years old, but it doesn't drink four years old. It drinks more of a six, seven-year-old because we actually use heat cycle warehouses. Not a lot. I mean, I don't think anybody else uses those. It was pretty common practice, um, but we use steam heat. Once the temperature drops down around 62 degrees Fahrenheit or so, we crank on the heat so that we're making sure to maximize exposure of that fluid inside the staves. So we're sort of force aging it. We're maturing it right. more so than its chronological age. Um, so in the 90s... We need consistency 
is anybody really like only drinking bonded whiskey in the 90s? No. I mean, right. It was so all over the place. To produce a consistent product, we pull ourselves out of bond. The main difference here is that this is a blend of six to 12 year whiskey and not just one distiller season. So the signature 100 proof is a blend of six to 12 year old bourbon. Um, again, though, it's not drinking like six to 12 year old bourbon. It's drinking much higher than that. When I say six to 12 year old, I mean, it's majority of six, mostly. Yeah. Right. But as barrels age, you guys mentioned a little thing about birthday bourbon, which we're not drinking, but it is out there. I swear. <laughs> um, I've got a few bottles with at home, that so lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not to say if a barrel goes bad, there's no bad here. It's just if it's sort of creating a weird outlier in the lot, it's got to go somewhere. You don't just let it die in the warehouse. So where do you think it goes? It goes into Signature. There it's you a little go. insider secret. Um, Take note. There you go. So those are our two what I like to call modern expressions. And then we have Whiskey Row. So there are more to come with Whiskey Row, but so far we have the 1870 and 1897. Um, Earlier, we talked about how we used to pull from three different distilleries. So in order to honor that practice, we have pulled from three different warehouses for each of these. Because at that time in Old Forester's history, that's what we were doing. And so Mm -hmm. we're sort of trying to commemorate where we were back then. These don't have any modern filtration on them. They're run through a sieve and taking the barrel chunks out and watering them back to whatever proof we need. And that's it. So I don't know what the perception is about the clouding once you add ice or water to bourbon. Some people think it's a sign of quality. Some people think it's a flaw. It's just, it is what it is. I mean, you're leaving a lot of oils in there by not chill filtering the bourbon. Right. So these guys are not chill filtered. The, 1890s, or the 1870 is 90 proof because that's where we started. 1897 is 100 proof because it's bottled in bond, obviously. They're both about four years old. So what was the, I guess, the market reaction of having to bring two new types of uh, labels to the market for this new like whiskey row edition? I don't know what the market's reaction. I mean, it's been positive so far. But as far as Old Forester as a brand, we're very proud of our heritage. And the whole purpose of the Whiskey Row series is to celebrate milestones in our history here in Kentucky. So we started in 1870. So, of course, the first one we released out of the series was 1870. Try to mimic it. I mean, these are very more of our boutique line, if you will. I mean, it's not secretly and highly allocated like birthday bourbon. It's definitely more readily available than that, and it is a permanent line extension. Um, but we're talking 21 barrels being pulled for a dump of this stuff, seven barrels out of each of three warehouses. So it's a pretty small lot, if That's you think about it. It's like, you know, there's no yeah. typical thing as a small batch Right, bourbon, it doesn't exist. But, but 21's pretty damn small. Right. Compared to our other, I mean, the 86 and the Signature are 200 barrels at a time. So... Mm-hmm. It definitely takes a lot more skill and strategy to fine-tune a flavor profile with a smaller amount of barrels than it does with a big amount of barrels. It's sort of like just keep adding things to a punch until it tastes good. You know, the more things you put in there, the more just... Yeah, Red yeah. Bull, Why Everclear. did you just look at him so clear? Like, remember that time? No, and it's I. all good. <laughs> so we start with 1870, and then the bottle of Monduct, obviously, and the timeline comes along next. 1897, we have a few more releases, but ultimately they lead up to the opening of our new distillery. Um, I say new, but new, we're going back into a building that we were in yeah, so many years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. exactly. So that's the whole point of saying Whiskey Row series. Whiskey Row in Louisville, I'm sure you guys, I mean, you guys are bourbon geeks, if you will. Yes, um, so we actually, we interviewed. You are nerds. Yeah, well, we actually, you know, we remember, uh, I forget what the episode, but we interviewed Marianne, who was the preservation, uh, for Preservation Louisville on a help, actually help saving Whiskey Row. So, um, so yeah, we, we're pretty familiar with it. Yeah. So, I mean, we started on Whiskey Row further down the street in what's now an interior design building, but the location on Whiskey Row that we were in, we're going back to that same spot. Um, the new distillery will open there. I say new distillery. We have a distillery, I swear. We just don't do public tours in that distillery because it was built in the 30s and was not meant for pub. No one went on public bourbon tours yeah. in the 30s, you know, so. It was very industrial. Not it's blameless. very industrial. Vintage industrial, if That's you will. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a gorgeous space. I mean, it's really cool to get the behind the scenes tour there if you ever do get a chance to do that. But we definitely need to share our whole process because start to finish, we own the process. So at the new distillery, you'll see barrels being raised. There's fermentation, there's distillation, there's things are going into the barrel, things are coming out and getting bottled there. It's the whole experience top to bottom. No other brand has that. Right. I mean, no one else really has their own barrels, so no one can really ever own that space. But 
you get to see Old Forester and every single element that makes it what it is in the bottle. That's interesting. So I guess we'll talk about the uh, the one shining light that a lot of people are always the bottle chasing, right? So let's talk about the birthday bourbon just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just, just give, a little. Just give some, some listeners kind of like an idea of um, why was it created and why is it so special? Okay, so birthday bourbon is released in September in Kentucky. I say that. It's not everywhere in September. Um, It sort of ripples out into the markets after that. But it's to celebrate George Garvin Brown as our founder's birthday. It comes out to celebrate his birthday. It's gone in an hour Mm -hmm. or less than an hour. Um, It sort of depends on the lot of whiskey. So it's about 12 years old. It's made from one day's production. It's very, very carefully looked after by our master distiller through its entirety of maturation. And every year is completely different. That's that's what's so amazing about it. It's it's about the same age every single year. It's a different proof because whiskey expresses itself differently at different proofs. And so he identifies which one after he dumps the barrels it's going to be tasting best at. Um, I actually had the pleasure of helping him out with that this year. It's a really cool experience to be able to proof birthday bourbon. I mean, years back I was bartending and I'm mm-hmm. proofing birthday bourbon. Like, pinch right. me, you yeah. know? So. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's great. A lot of people say, well, I got more last year. There's less going on. You're creating a fake shortage. A lot of people get accused of fake shortages. No, no not it's the just case. Demand. It's, it's and demand. as we expand in more markets, it's diluted out, you know, and not everyone gets as much and demand definitely plays a huge role in it. Um, I used to always coming from behind the bar. I used to always think the whole, sometimes we open barrels and they're empty was completely a myth, but not the case at all. The day we pulled samples to proof. Actually, one of the barrels was completely dead, and it was the saddest sight ever. It was like a skeleton of what would have been amazing bourbon, and it was just like dry and crinkly and hanging out in the corner. So it does happen. <laughs> it, it does. It I, does I went happen. To a, a private barrel selection that happened. A barrel. It only. Oh, no. It only had about twelve <laughs> bottles left in it, and it was oh. the best one of the batch. And we we're like, well, oh, I bet. And they're like, sorry, I can't sell this one to you. Like, yeah. Dang. I mean, this year's birthday. Am I allowed to speak on this? Absolutely. I can't tell you what the proof is, but I can tell you. What about the color of the tag? Because the color changes every year, right? I can't tell you the color. I can't tell you (laughs) any of that. What I can tell you is it was from a very high floor, and some of the bottles sat by a window, so they were nice and honey blonde and sun-kissed and gorgeous. I can tell you that at least one of the 93 in that lot was empty, and I can tell you that... What came out of the rest that I know of was delicious. So that's all that's we, need all to we know. can that's say. All we need to know. Well, that's fantastic. So let's let's start wrapping up a little bit. So we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about your cocktails, right? So okay. give yeah, us some of the for this. some of the more like known, like really well known cocktails that that you make with either Old Force or any kind of whiskey in general that that maybe people uh, maybe want to know more about. Sure. So Old Forester, we like to hang our hat on the old-fashioned um, for no other reason than it's a very spirit-forward driven drink. I mean, it's simply, in our minds, bitter sugar in Old Forester, um, but it lets the spirit shine through. The cocktails we have in our strategy go all the way from tiki drinks to classics, I mean, across the board. Number one, I want to show versatility of the product. Um, number two, I want to show historical application of the product, so those, that's how those classics come into play. But most importantly, we just want to show that there's a philosophy behind a great cocktail. And it's not about number of ingredients. It's not about exoticness of ingredients. It's about correct technique, fresh ingredients, and just doing it right. And I think that's consistent with the brand straight through. The entire history of Old Forester has always been based on decisions of this is just the right way to do it. So this is how we're going to do it. And we're kind of unapologetic about it. So our cocktail technique and strategy follows the exact same mantra. Um, it's not mix all. I, I, no hate, one can see word. me doing quotes. I don't use the M word. I don't use the M word. I really don't. Um, I feel like I should get flogged for saying it earlier then, right? I mean, <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. Just, no, it's totally fine. Everybody is welcome to their own opinion of everything. Um, I just personally don't prefer the M word. I think that bartending is an amazing craft that deserves respect in and of itself, and we don't have to like church it up into a different category in order to recognize how challenging of a career path it is for people to commit to. So, Old Forester, back to the drinks. Um, they're all over the board. They're completely all over the board and on purpose, but they're all done with mindful, thoughtful technique and with balance because it's a balanced bourbon. Drinks should be balanced. Life should be balanced. 
everything should be ba- everything in balance, everything in moderation, and everything in balance, including Old Forester and cocktails. So we talked about old fashioned. Give us give us one more, one of your favorites that you would do, and maybe like list some ingredients and how you would make it. So so our sure. listeners might be able to try it at one point. Oh, absolutely. Sours are always a good mention. Um, personally, I feel like there's a tricky point with sours where if you're just off a little bit, it's curdled and off putting when you use egg white. Um, there's also this weird thing that happens when you mix citrus with oak for some reason. There's always like a hint of what I call dirt, and I probably shouldn't say dirt, <laughs> earthiness, uh, if you will. Uh, yes, like a little fresh um, brown dirt. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Grandma's old clothes found right. in the basement. Right. <laughs> but Old Forester, as a brand, has a natural dryness on the finish. And so anything you pair it with works wonders. I think ginger especially works really well with it. And I don't mean with ginger ale, unless that's your cup of tea, then that's fine. Um, But substituting Old Forester in place of a base spirit for a French 75, for example, so you're using about an ounce, an ounce and a half Old Forester, half an ounce to three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, and then using ginger syrup instead of using sugar, shaking, straining, and topping with sparkling wine. It's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Let's make them right now. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. I should have had those for you guys. We're waiting. No, I'm just kidding. I know. Uh, So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So Jackie, uh, thank you once again for coming on the show today. Uh, It was great to uh, finally get this all set up, learn more about Old Forester's history because it's it's one of those things that you always see it on the shelf, right? And it's it's one of those things that it, it actually has it has really authentic feel to it because it still is something that's owned by fifth generation Browns today. Exactly. 70% of Brown Foreman shareholding is still by the family. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that at least in Kentucky and in Louisville, uh, the Brown name is something that's very prominent. Right. And wouldn't you trust the cities in bourbon country and their choice of bourbon? <laughs> I'm right. just saying. Trust just us. Say trust, trust us. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know what we're talking about. So, uh, so Ryan, wrap us up. Yeah, thanks for uh, setting me straight on the you know the Woodford and Old Forester thing. I, My pleasure. Yeah, now Trust I can me. tell people and, and not feel so stupid about it. But no, uh, you know I'm not from here. I'm from Bardstown, and you know Louisville. I, there's a lot of brands in Bardstown. I'm proud of because I'm from there. But now I live in Louisville. You know Old Forester's, you know a part of that brand that I can connect with because it's all around the Browns. You know, have obviously had their hand in this development of this city. So it's really cool, uh, you know, to learn about it. And hopefully the listeners will get the same that I did. Fantastic. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Bourbon Pursuit. And we will see you all next time. See you next time. time.